Uh, okay, so, <laughs> so Alexandra, why don't you, um, you kickstart? You can introduce yourself yeah. and, and yeah, yeah, take yeah. it from there. Hi everyone, um, it's a pity that we cannot see you all, but uh, as Enrique said, you can maybe join us also on the video. Um, so my name is Alexandra Chmielewska and I am coordinator of projects and fundraising at the IMED. And prior to that, I was managing a, a network of think tanks uh, in the Euro-Mediterranean region named Euromisk. So I will be um, today, especially, um, well, I, I will wear a double hat today, so I'll try to facilitate the session, first of all, and, and secondly, also give some insights on the um, inclusion of young uh, people in, in the think tank world. So um, I'm not sure if we, maybe, shall we make a quick round between the panelists just to present themselves, and then we'll kick off. Sure. All right. So Pauline, maybe let's start. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, where do we start? Um, so my, hello, everybody. My name is Pauline. Um, my uh, normal day job is at Bruegel, uh, the Brussels-based economics uh, think tank. Um, and uh, I'm here both with that hat as well as uh, with my um, hat as a volunteer in the Brussels binder, which is uh, I can tell you a bit more about it maybe when uh, when uh, when we kickstart the discussion. Um, but yes, that's, mm. that is me. <laughs> All right. Marcos, then we move to you. Sure. Uh, hi, uh, Marcos Gonzalez Hernando. Uh, I'm both an academic working on think tanks and a think tank researcher at the moment. Uh, on, with, on my academic hat, so to speak, I recently wrote a book on think tanks after the economic crisis and how they change intellectually institutionally. And on my policy research hat, um, I work on a project on attitudes towards economic inequality of the top 10% of income earners. And right now I'm actually starting to work on a working paper on economic inequality and think tanks for, uh, which is going to be published with uh, the Young Think Tank Working Paper series. Uh, it's just starting to have some resources. We kind of, we are losing you, no? We are losing the voice, mm -hmm. no? <laughs> Oh shoot! <laughs> okay. But if but if oh, you that's... if you started to explain a little bit more details about the book, maybe maybe you will expand it during the now your intervention because sure. it's very much related to the topic that we'll discuss. So yeah. Sure. Okay, L Laura. Then... Hi everyone. Um, I work for a think tank um, in London called Chatham House. Um, and there I'm the research partnerships and inclusion officer. So um, I basically work on um, fundraising and relationship development with foundations and governments. Um, and then I also coordinate um, what we have an internal uh, group called the Gender Working Group. Um, so I speak to you today with that hat on. Okay, and last but not least, Rose. Um, hi everyone, my name is Rose Mutiso. Um, I wear two, mainly two hats. So uh, main hat is I, I run the Mawazo Institute in Nairobi, it's Ideas Institute. It's kind of um, not really, it's a think tank-ish organization. Our mission is supporting female scholarship and thought leadership in East Africa. So we help young women get PhDs and we also give them a lot of training and resources around policy engagement, public engagement and other kind of uh, skill building to enable them to do good research, but also to be influencing discourse and issues in society. And then, um, so that's most of what I do. And I think about um, inclusivity in terms of um, young women and African African young women, young women, um, you know, young African women specifically, and in academic sectors. Um, and then my other hat is I'm the research director of a think tank in Washington, DC called the Energy for Growth Hub. And um, this is a network of experts all over the world who are working on um, evidence-based solutions to energy deficits in developing countries. All right, thank you. So these are our panelists and myself as a facilitator and a panelist. Um, so, so let's start. Um, I must say that when I was preparing for the uh, for this session, I oh, did yeah, not find. Can I, yeah. can I can I just ask? Um, May I ask sure. the people in the in the in the group in the session to use the chat option to maybe introduce yourselves so that the the, the, ah, the yeah. conveners know who is who is online. Yeah, sure. okay. So yeah. when you do when you use the chat, make sure you are in the session tab, not event tab. So the session will only chat only 
Kate, Katie Murray just um, just joined in, so um, that will um, that will help us see who is who is um, joining us. Thanks. Anyway, that's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So sh shall I? Can I? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, well, when I was preparing for this session, I must say that I did not find much articles about the diversity and inclusion in um, in think tanks. Neither I found uh, when searching through individual websites of one of the most renowned think tanks in the world, any sort of statistics or um, information, more detailed information about the uh, um, demography of, of the workforce uh, related not only to gen generation, but also gender, race and, and ethnicity. There are a lot of articles about the diversity and inclusiveness in business, um, according to which, uh, and I quote, this is a report published by McKinsey, the greater proportion of, of women and ethnic cultural composition correlates with uh, with the company's outperformance. So, so at this session, so, so as we can see, as, I, as far as I could see, um, the, this topic still remains uh, very much un, uncovered by, by, uh, by research and also in the, in the academic debates. So we'll try to fill this gap with our session today um, and reflect first of all on um, well, whether and um, how the diversity and inclusiveness impact the research produced by think tanks um, and whether maybe it correlates with the public trust um, in, those, um, in those institutions. Right, so you already know our five um, and five panelists, but before before we start and to warm up a little bit the audience, we want to uh, ask you a question and I'm sure Kika will help us to arrange the poll. Um, yeah, so the question is, uh, do you think that think tanks are inclusive? And the answer is yes or no. Uh, so let us see what what the audience has to say about that. So you have to go to polls um, right at the top, and just it will be the the last one there for you to uh, or the one you see right away, the first one. Okay. Uh, on the top. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's it's pretty one sided at the moment. Let's wait some some minutes to yeah. for it to appear. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. making it a case in point for the session yes <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> a very gloomy picture in this <laughs> oh, oh, all right yeah. we have 19 people so let's wait maybe for some more okay there is one optimist uh, person <laughs> Okay, maybe let's wait for another. Will there be another optimist person or? <laughs> it would be interesting to ask the optimist, whoever that person is, but I don't want to put him or her on the spot. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe we'll see that in the, in the discussion. We'll be able to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, yeah. As we can see, you are not very optimistic about the, the inclusiveness of think tanks. Um, however, I mean, the diversity and inclusiveness, of course, um, can be divided, as, as I already said at the beginning, into gender, geographical, ethnic, socioeconomic, and generational, um, uh, generational uh, diversity. So, so each of our panelists will try to cover uh, those different um, Parts. Um, let's let's start first with uh, with Pauline, who, as uh, she already said, uh, she's a member of Brussels Binder. So this is an initiative that aims to bring more women to to uh, debates in European think tanks, right? Um, so can you tell us, as a member of Brussels Binder um, and an activist for gender equality in research debates? 
what is the situation uh, when it comes to gender um, inclusiveness and gender diversity in, in the European um, fintechs? All right, so perhaps I can start with giving a very, very quick intro on what the Brussels Binder is. So as you, uh, as you mentioned, so it's, a, it's an initiative that's run entirely by volunteers uh, from the think tank sector and, um, and, uh, and other and more and more sectors in Brussels. Um, we created this uh, over three years ago now. Um, so it really originated from a group of women in think tanks uh, who got tired of seeing the same faces in, a, in, a, in events and on panels uh, all around town. Uh, so we created an online database of women experts uh, in Brussels and extending from Brussels into all of Europe. Uh, so the database is free. Uh, experts are free to create uh, their own profiles uh, and anybody uh, accessing the website can search for experts. Uh, and we cover really all the sectors. Uh, to date, we have, I checked this morning, we have over 1400 experts registered. Um, and although it's a bit hard to track exactly how many experts get found, uh, thanks to the Brussels binder, we estimate um, uh, from our data that uh, about 50 experts get contacted every month, uh, uh, thanks to our platform. Um, and through promoting, uh, through promoting our work and a database, it means that we also do quite a bit of advocacy and, uh, and we try to raise awareness of the issue that is the lack of diversity um, in European debates. Um, whether it's um, in debates, whether it's at events, so from think tanks, because we are we are a, a sector that organizes a lot of those, uh, but also events that are convened by other organizations. Uh, so uh, we are in touch and work a lot with uh, with uh, the public institutions, the EU institutions in particular, as well as uh, organizations from the civil society, from the private sector, etc. Um, but we also uh, do realize that the lack of uh, diversity in debates is also uh, very much a, a product of a lack of diversity in media and reporting. So we're increasingly working with journalists and editors um, to uh, to also uh, change this and get more uh, more uh, women experts on debates. Um, Recently, we also received funding from the European Commission to do two things that I think might be of interest to uh, this group of think tankers. Uh, one is to connect uh, beyond Brussels. Um, so uh, there's actually a lot of other initiatives like ours um, who are doing the same thing or have very similar objectives. So there's actually quite a lot, if you search for them, um, quite a lot of other databases, but they might target one specific region or, or one country or be specific to a sector. Um, and very soon, normally, you should be able to search through um, uh, a lot of those databases in Europe and in the world, a lot of databases of women experts uh, on our websites, but uh, fingers crossed, uh, we managed to get them to unroll this very fast. Um, and some of our ongoing work is, uh, is working hand in hand uh, with think tanks uh, to monitor and track diversity and inclusion. Uh, so we're working specifically with our founding think tanks, uh, which are the big think tanks in Europe, uh, as well as um, as well as some uh, so, some others, uh, to collect uh, statistics and uh, monitor what progress is being made, um, share a lot of best practices, also for for to increase diversity and inclusion in within the think tanks, not only just at events. Uh, so if I really <laughs> want to uh, to um, to answer to answer really your question on uh, well mapping the current situation uh, related to gender inclusion um, in uh, in European think tanks um, I would um, I would mention maybe two pieces of work uh, that are uh, that are more interesting than hearing me speak um, if you want to look at the situation so uh, one thing is um, two reports that have been done by open society foundations uh, with whom we're, we're working quite closely um, and in 2018, they published uh, they published a report that analyzed the top, so the big policy events that were held uh, between 2012 and 2016, if I remember right. Um, and so there, they found quite damning numbers uh, because they found out that only 25% of speaking positions in those events uh, are held by women in European uh, policy events, 17% uh, uh, being moderator, uh, well, 17% of moderators positions being held by women and only 8% of keynotes, uh, keynote speeches. Um, and they also looked a bit through sectors and the, those figures that I just mentioned are even lower. Um, and it's, it's, the situation is especially bad uh, if you look at uh, topics um, for events and conferences on uh, foreign policy, security, economics, so in certain sectors, the situation is actually even worse. 
Um, there's also an organization called, uh, sadly now they're they're defunct, but they did a very very uh, well incredible work over uh, the last few years called the EU Panel Watch. So they were really watching and reporting on uh, pointing fingers at uh, at panels that would be uh, what we call in the jargon the manals, the all male panels. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, they used to do a yearly uh, report. They would pick one month um, uh, as the monitoring month, analyze the statistics uh, from all events happening in Brussels for one month uh, to look at what's uh, what's uh, what's going on. And uh, one thing that I think is worth mentioning is if you look at the few reports over the years, even though we, we like to think that uh, there's more initiatives and a lot of stuff is uh, is happening, actually the figures are not changing that much over time. So progress is extremely slow. Um, and um, I think one of the latest reports in, uh, in 2017 uh, shed light also on some alarming figures. Um, one was that only 11% of, uh, of panels were balanced uh, in terms of gender. Um, and if we look at ethnicity um, um, and, uh, and race, in excluding the one event that's a big EU annual event on development policy, if we exclude that one, actually 99% of uh, speaking roles uh, in Brussels are held by white people. Um, oh. So yeah, <laughs> the situation. The situation. There's a lot of progress that can be made, um, and it's the same. And if we look at the media, we're quite quite far from uh, from getting uh, from getting reporting that is uh, that is uh, balanced. So women journalists, women reporters, women experts featuring on media, whether it's print, broadcast, or on the internet, uh, we're still very far away from uh, from reaching uh, 50 50 let's say. So that definitely proves why we need the Brussels binder um, and other initiatives in, uh, in Brussels and in Europe. Uh, but I think there's some encouraging things, at least uh, from, from our perspective, working very uh, closely with European think tanks. We do see that, uh, that people are committed to improving the situation. Um, and uh, so actually a few weeks ago, we, had a, we did a launch with the heads of the, uh, of, uh, the big European think tanks. And we had a big launch discussion about this very topic. Um, so a lot of heads of think tanks were reporting um, and uh, encouraging, I would say, improvements um, uh, in their own institutions. So, uh, so internally and individually, if we look at, uh, at, at numbers, sometimes it's a bit better than in aggregate. Um, and they were also uh, very open to share best practices. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I was surprised to see that even at the at the top level. So if you talk to directors and and head of think tanks, that they are they can actually get down to the to talking about diversity and inclusion uh, on very operational terms. Um, uh, and on that, right. actually, yeah. Let's let's not talk about best practices because we will <laughs> tackle that uh, later. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, thank you already for giving this broad picture, also a bit gloomy, right, uh, mm -hmm. regarding the diversity and inclusiveness of women, right? Because one thing is how many women participate in conferences, but another thing is when, which roles. So, so, so this is another another problem, right? So let's let's turn to, to we won't abandon the topic of gender. Uh, it will feature strongly today, but let's now uh, move to to Marcos. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning, you have been focusing in your research on um, inequalities of access in terms of socioeconomic background to to think tanks. So, can you paint us a picture on on that issue? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, well, first of all, uh, caveat um, is that two things, really. The first one is that I arrived at the topic of uh, inequalities of socioeconomic background on think tanks obliquely through my research at the task, which I'll speak about in a second. Uh, the second one is that I'm at the moment just starting work on a working paper for on think tanks, which is going to be out hopefully by September, which is precisely on our topic. And the third one is that perhaps we're still operationalizing actually how to detect social uh, background because it's obviously uh, less transparent or less uh, immediately obvious than uh, gender or race. At least, you know, uh, at least you don't necessarily see it uh, with names. So in some, in, in some countries you kind of do, I guess. <laughs> and I'm going to speak about that in a second. Now, how did I get to this topic? First of all, I was looking at um, in my current work as a think tank researcher. I'm working on a project on uh, attitudes towards economic inequality of the top 10% of income earners. And the reason why we're focusing on that, by the way, the report was going to be launched in late April. Now, I don't really know what's going to happen. 
but the reason why we focused on this um, topic is because previous research from uh, political science shows that the quality preference link, which is basically the uh, degree to which the preferences of a particular population and actual policy outcomes coincide, is strongest with the top 10% of income earners, for whatever reason and through whatever mechanism. Okay, And this group of income earners tends to have a, a relatively different view on policy than the rest of the population. You might uh, find this, you know, this resonates, I guess. Um, they're generally, compared to the rest, less uh, supportive of restrictive immigration policies, more internationalist in the foreign policy outlook, uh, also more liberal on issues such as uh, same-sex marriage. But they're also less likely to support redistribution and higher taxation, especially for the rich. I guess for uh, I guess for expectable reasons. Uh, and being that this group is also uh, the most influential, um, I find it actually quite interesting to think about it in terms of what's happening in the world of think tanks now, with uh, you know this rise of this uh, discourse that um, that sort of pins. Uh, the world of experts against the against the populist, I guess, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to look into the socioeconomic background of uh, of members of think tanks. Now, in the little that I've done by now, I've been focusing on several countries of different Gini coefficients, eight at the moment, and I started looking at Chile, and which is the country that I know best in terms of. Uh, um, it's sort of, sort of the political debates and also sort of socially and the results are immediately quite stark. Uh, I hope that I have something more to give you back in September, but that's more or less how I arrived at the topic and I hope this is useful. Okay, I, I had the impression that we were also losing you a little bit in the in the end, but <laughs> but I hope it's only on my on my side some technical technical issues. Um, thanks, Marcos. Yeah, I know that you will you will also add a lot to the uh, later on to the next question. We'll focus on on research precisely. Um, I want to add something on youth, but before that, maybe Laura, would you like to uh, add something to this to, the, to this mapping picture of Pauline or? Um, Regarding the gender? Um, well, I thought I would come in at the end during the practical. Later. All right. Um, so it, let's, uh, let's I won't uh, mess the order. Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, be, before we turn to Rose, and I will now put my hat of, of a of a panelist. Um, I will add some few few some few words about the inclusion of of um, generational inclusion and inclusiveness in think tanks. So. Um, I'm afraid that also I will be only able to give you a rather gloomy picture. Um, and again, here I want to highlight that I will focus on the Euro Mediterranean region because this is this has been my uh, professional professional um, focus again. Um, so still, uh, as as far as my my research uh, and also my experience with working. Um, working with think tanks from the European region shows um, young people and especially the generation of millennials, uh, uh, you know, the people born in 80s, 90s, represent a, uh, rather a minority in the organizational structure of, of think tanks. Um, this, of course, does not correlate with uh, you know, with the composition of the society, especially in the MENA region, where young people constitute uh, over 60% of, uh, of the society in, in some countries. So this I already found a, a bit problematic, but we can tackle that in the, in the debate. What does it mean then for the uh, maybe projection of think tanks, right? Uh, but one thing is uh, is the diversity. So how many young people are actually working in think tanks and how many young researchers are there? Um, but again, uh, another thing is for me the um, the inclusiveness, right? So the um, uh, which I understand as equal opportunities to everyone and the ability to be given to be given a voice. Um, so again, here uh, when it comes to the think tanks in the Euro Mediterranean region. Uh, most of young people working in think tanks um, do not have a very um, 
responsible positions, I would say. They are rather working in administrative, um, uh, lower, lower administrative uh, positions. And when it comes to research, they're rather covering um, positions of, uh, of research support and not um, researchers per se, right? Um, um, what I could uh, also add to that is the, um, in addition to that, when we have been organizing many, many forests for young researchers in the Euro-Mediterranean region and um, the main um, obstacles and challenges young people, again, uh, in think tanks and in particular young researchers were um, enumerating uh, were first of all uh, lack uh, of trust from senior researchers and from senior officers in their institutes, uh, which creates a sort of a glass ceiling for them for their personal development and maybe also contribution to the work of the institute. Um, also limited funding for research uh, that, that, again, influences maybe their possibility to join think tanks in the future because they uh, certainly have less experience in producing research. Um, difficulty to, to gather and obtain data, again, maybe because of their age and related to that uh, because of the lack of trust. Um, and finally, uh, obstacles to, to publish. So these are the, the four obstacles that were mentioned by by young researchers. Um, of course, here again, I'm sure that there are differences between um, generational inclusiveness in the EU, between the EU and between the MENA, MENA countries, and also within the EU region. But I just wanted to give this um, broader picture, right? Um, so, um, mm, yeah. Well, let's maybe let's maybe uh, what I also wanted to add. Um, certainly, I don't want to be too too uh, pessimistic neither, because as far as I can see, since um, 2008 the economic crisis and also 2011 the Arab uprisings, certainly there has uh, been a growing attention to the importance of including young people. Um, so this may have played a role in the um, increasing awareness of the importance. Um, and awareness, uh, according to me, is the first step to, to act. So, so um, we can see some improvement, but still, uh, as in the case of gender uh, inclusiveness and diversity, the progress is still slow, but the awareness, at least, it's, uh, it's there. So... Um, so this is this is regarding the the youth, and I uh, will be able to maybe um, expand on that in the in the debate. But let's uh, let's now focus geographically uh, to and zoom into the African continent only. Um, uh, Rose, um, you 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 mentioned that your work um, involves supporting women and particularly young women in African academic sector. So, what are if you can map the diversity challenges in the African uh, economy, um, African uh, knowledge, you know, ecosystem, um, and how does uh, how does it affect the the whole functioning of the of the academic sector in Africa? Um, yeah, uh, so this is, it's always uh, interesting to, to speak in this kind of setting, uh, re representing Africa, but, um, you know, I like the, the approach, I, I do like the approach here at intersectionality, so looking at inclusion in terms of gender, use, socioeconomic um, uh, status and all of these things, and I think something that's quite interesting about Africa is, you know, we're just kind of a category, onto our, a, a permanently excluded category, and so whether you are rich, man who is very senior in Africa, you're still, you know, you're still excluded and underrepresented. And so um, it reminds me a little bit with my other hat, I, 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 I think and write about um, energy and climate change in Africa. And so obviously the climate change response for Africa is we have no impact and it's not our fault. So, so similar, to the, similar to that, I think you know, um, when it comes to Africa, African um, representation of African in global conversations and the global think tanks here, 
um, across all of the different demographical demographic categories, we are really, really underrepresented. And um, for me, my work is focused on young women specifically, but I just wanted to set the scene that actually across the board, there's a, there's a big structural problem and uh, Africans are missing, whether they are women or men or whoever they are from global conversations. And, um, you know, my work kind of starts with this um, idea of an expert class. And I think this was also raised in the keynote before. And this is, you know, the, the, the pool that feeds the think tank. Uh, that, that, that enables the think tank sphere and enables us to have evidence and knowledge kind of enter into uh, policy and um, everyday and society. Uh, it's, an, it's an important modality. And so uh, we have a very weak expert class, uh, you know, in, in Africa. And for me, I try to trace that back to one important breeding ground for experts, which is the academic sector. Um, of course, experts and practitioners can be bred in many different settings, but this is where I focus because I think it's very, um, um, uh, it, it, it's is a good indicator of, um, uh, well, it's, it's emblematic of, of, of the bigger problem. And so, you know, within academia, we have very, uh, our academic institutions are very weak. Um, uh, there's, they were abandoned. There was a little bit of a post-independence push towards strengthening them, but that was abandoned. And I mean, in some ways we have bigger priorities like universal literacy and health and other things, but this is a space that has really been left behind. And so we don't produce as many of, 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 of these experts and scholars and people who then feed into the think tank ecosystem. Um, right now, I think the stats, and again, we, we have a big data problem. Uh, there are some stats and reports I could share, but um, unfortunately not as rich as some of what um, we see in other, other, other places, but you know, for example, in our universities, um, and this is in Kenya, for example, less than half of our uh, academic staff have PhDs. Um, and uh, the academic sector is very, very small relative to the population. Um, a lot of the other stats we see are, uh, sorry, from the science. Uh, uh, measures of scientific outputs. So Africa produces less than one percent of papers relative to the world. There, and so there, you can dig into that that kind of stat. But I mean, the idea is that, and and this is kind of um, intuitive that we have a very um, a, a very small academic sector, and within this sector, um, which then feeds the experts who uh, become senior people at the World Bank and at the UN and like running big international organizations. The people who really make it out of that system are men. And so I'm sure you've all encountered the really kind of distinguished, gray-haired, male African professors. Um, there are some female counterparts, you know, the, I don't know, uh, Ngozi's and Glamini's, whatever, the Zulu. Um, <laughs> you know, there are a couple of the women who fit that class. But first, it's a very kind of gray-haired, kind of senior elder class of experts that kind of show up in this global stage of African influencers and thinkers, and most of them are men. Um, and so to solve this problem, we have to go really, really deep, um, deep into the pipeline in Africa. You know, it's not enough to um, intervene at the level of the think tanks, you know, really at the terminal stages, because we need to strengthen that um, pipeline that produces the experts that make it out on the other end. And so um, that's the work that I, you know, the work that I'm focused on is a little bit, um, it's a, a at an advanced part of the pipeline, because we're working with women at the PhD level, but they're still to get them credentialed and move, you know, and and trained to be broad, broad-minded, um, savvy, uh, understand politics, understand policy, that kind of thing. But even then, we struggle because there's such a small pipeline of women who can be um, supported at that level. And so, I think the punchline for me is um, in the African situation, uh, you really need to have a ecosystem approach and interventions that come just at the think tank level are um, are not taking into consideration the really significant pipeline challenges we have that need to be addressed in order to create change. But uh, it's not all bad. Um, you know, it's, it's a really growing sector because uh, I know there's a lot of opportunity. There's um, in some space, in some ways, it's, it's a green greenfield space, and we can really learn from the mistakes that have been made elsewhere and create new um, structures um, for and, and new approaches to build um, an inclusive and vibrant and and and, and uh, energetic 
um, knowledge ecosystem. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Um, so we we did this short mapping exercise of uh, of diversity and inclusiveness when it comes to the organization stru organizational structure of, of think tanks. But let us now turn more to to the uh, to the research. Right. So um, Mark, let's start with you, as you already announced uh, that you are also tackling the um, not only the socioeconomic um, inclusion and diversity in when it comes to the organization and governance of think tanks, but also um, also research. So maybe first question to you would be: Do you think that the um, uh, or, or whether and how the inclusiveness and diversity in the organizational governments uh, governance uh, in think tanks affect the content of research. Um, what has been your uh, what, what what is your opinion on that? I, I know you you conducted also some uh, some research on that, right? Yeah, some research on that. Uh, yes, that that's correct. Um, I mean, it's very difficult for me to speak in relation to. Uh, to think to the discourse of think tanks in general, but I would say the following. Recently, I saw a lecture, I think it was on the Council of Foreign Relations, if I'm correct, on the future of think tanks in this era of uh, post truth politics. And um, the discourse actually more or less on the line, and this is probably part of their, their own ecosystem of, um, you know. Uh, you know, sort of ticking all the boxes of what surveys say that people in the top echelon, so people who earn the most, tend to think, which is more or less the sort of ideological position of the economist, generally speaking. Uh, and uh, that is, on, on the one hand, not surprising, but on the other, uh, and I mean, I'm not here basically to, th to say that I think I should think one thing or another, but that nevertheless there's a, there's a striking overlap between the two things, uh, which, I found, which I find rather interesting. Also, I was thinking as both Rose and you, Alexander, were speaking, that perhaps uh, one of the issues that we're facing, particularly in relation to uh, eco socioeconomic inequality, is that we have a proxy variable in between, which is education. Uh, I don't know how it is uh, where you work, Rose, but I imagine that in most countries, uh, access to higher education, or at least access, access to elite institutions within higher education is highly prized. Uh, generally is a particular segment of the population that tends to access to uh, these elite institutions, um, let alone PhDs, masters, uh, etc. And in countries like my own Chile, uh, foreign degrees are very much priced. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, that, that, might, that might create some form of, uh, I don't know to call it echo chamber, but generally, um, yeah, but it, it definitely sort of uh, narrows the pool of uh, people that think that think tanks tend to employ. And one of the reasons why think tanks employ people from elite backgrounds and elite institutions is maybe with people, to be completely honest, with people like myself who have a PhD, uh, who, uh, yeah, who've been doing research on academia, but the academic job market is just simply terrible. So I end up working on think tanks. Uh, or, yeah, or people, yeah, or people working with that, yeah masters, etc., who end up uh, uh, joining these organizations. And in the end, uh, yeah, and in the end, I, I, I think that, that, uh, that, that is sort of expectable from the point of view of think tanks because part of the, the way that they bolster their reputation, the part of the way that they try to seem authoritative is precisely by employing people who know how to engage in the public debate, who know how to speak, who know how to write policy reports, uh, who know how to use social media, etc., and, and that's completely expectable. But the, uh, and there are, there have been, um, I know in many places, you know, um, attempts to do citizens think tanks or, or do more positive research approach. But I, I, at least at this stage of my research, I haven't really seen that much attempts to actually get people from different socioeconomic backgrounds crossed by uh, education into think tanks. Because it would be strange, I guess. Like, what would be the hiring process, I guess, for yeah, for uh, preferring a candidate who has a PhD versus another who doesn't? Yeah. Uh, 
we can if, if this is a question to us <laughs> right <laughs> or or, uh, yeah. or an issue to, to reflect i don't know ross if you would like to react react and maybe also if you could add a little bit because you tackled this um the 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 topic of inclusion of women in academic sector in Africa. But I also uh, um, I'm very interested to know and maybe the audience as well. What about this topic being a topic of a research? So I'm not only uh, yeah. referring to, you know, how many women are actually working in the academic sector, but whether the academic sector and research institutes in Africa are writing about this, uh, you know, or maybe Ethnic, ethnic inclusiveness, gender inclusiveness. This is, uh, so, yeah, a lot of interesting um, points. And uh, Marcos, I mean, a lot of your points are quite, um, uh, yeah, have, have given me a lot of um, pause to think. And, you know, on one hand, I think we should just, um, I don't know. I don't know if it's agree. I'm not sure if we're resigning ourselves to it. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but working for a think tank is a high skill job. Yeah, and this is kind of a part of the landscape in the same way that being um, a doctor requires some training. And I mean, not to say that we're equal to doctors and particularly not now, <laughs> but you know, it's a high skill job. And so maybe to some extent, um, training and higher education are prerequisites uh, not necessarily across the board but it, it's kind of one of those jobs where people need to be trained and and that in itself is an ex exclusionary activity um and, and that's kind of um our terrain and how can we um kind of ensure that people are getting skilled up and and um are trained to do the work they need to do at the level they need to but in a way that is i don't know maybe pulling more unusual suspects into this 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 exclusionary world and um, in the comments there's a guy I think from the Center for Poverty Analysis in I think Sri Lanka Kula Sabah Nathan um, who I, I, at some point I wish he could join or he or she could join the uh, about how they started with foreign trained um, English speaking um, staff members to now it, there's a balance between vernacular. English speakers and you know and it's mostly um, it's mostly an organization uh, staffed by women and so I think that's would be a really really great um, example to hear because I think even for me in Kenya we often struggle because we are often recruiting from the same circle of foreign educated uh, people who have this kind of quote unquote savvy in a way that we all understand each other you know you can um, uh, engage in these global yeah. set you you kind of you have the currency to engage in all of these global networks and um what can we do more to um train up people locally and that's part of what my organization is trying to do we're trying to substitute for the people who did not go abroad and get educated abroad the women who are kind of left behind in kenya what can we do to scale them up with equivalent skills so that they cannot be locked out because they don't have the networks and the exposure of these bigger global conversations one thing that we struggle with is that, um, and I'm sure many other think tanks and small organizations would identify with, is that we're kind of in a startup mode. A lot of things we're hustling. We love to take on young, more young people from the local ecosystem and train them up, and you know, uh, you know, uh, with uh, you know, mentor support foes, and we try to do that, but we're very constrained because we're pretty much underwater all the time just to stay alive. And so sometimes it's kind of expedient to just find the people who are, you know, ready to go. And and this is not just in terms of socioeconomic background. Sometimes I find like my organization is very young, you know, and many of us don't have families, and so we'll work. And we don't, you know, and that's, I think, also mm -hmm. kind of exclusionary, but we are often kind of like rushing around just to get it done. So I think, I don't know, Marcos, I don't know if I really answered your question, but yes, yeah, some, in, some, in, in some ways, this is a, a high skill job um, and people need to be trained yeah. for it. But then we need to do more to build that capacity locally, as opposed to just reaching for the low hanging we we've encountered elsewhere. Yeah. In terms of the question, Alexandra, um, of how um, I don't have, sorry, but anecdotally, <laughs> what we see uh, on the ground in a lot of Sub-Saharan Africa is actually um, a lot of the research funding 
within academia and uh, think tanks, uh, there is actually there, there are statistics about how much of our funding comes from external sources. I just don't have that right off my fingertips, but yes. So most of our funding is donor driv driven for research at universities. And now this is the anecdotal part, but it's something that I see all the time is actually the development partners set that agenda. So there's a lot of production of research on women. <laughs> and uh, right now there's a big interest in women in science. And so there are all of these RFPs going out all the time for people to do uh, how to support women in science, how to include women, um, how to include youth. Youth is another big development par uh, priority. And so there's kind of like an imposition of um, research production on these topics, but um, from the ground level, there's, it's like sometimes can be cynical. It's kind of that check boxing, uh, uh, box checking, sorry, box checking exercise where you kind of know how to write the, the, the proposal that gets the RFP that says, you know, okay, youth, gender, yes, yes, yes. And here's how we can build capacity among, among youth. And here's the kind of report for DFID. So interestingly, I almost feel like uh, these kind of preferred development topics have a lot of airtime and they're important, gender, women, youth, you know, everything <laughs> that we care about. But then uh, there's a weird perversion that I, I often see. And mm -hmm. some people who work in these pieces might be able to attest to. Yeah, well, I I will just add something to this tick boxing uh, when it comes to the, the youth and how, how youth uh, in features as a topic in in research so of course again since the economic crisis and Arab uprisings and again I'm focusing here on Euromed region um, youth issues ha have featured strongly in the in the uh, policy analysis right so there were um, many many research papers talking about youth marginalization disenfranchisement how um, how you know the exclusion of young people from political, social, and economic arena uh, impact their discontent and maybe may even lead to to further waves of protests and and uprising. But surprisingly, uh, or not, um, if you if you if you um, see the authors of those papers, most of them, of course, are not young researchers, but senior or even very very senior researchers right so so we can uh, engage and this is maybe yet another debate if you can only write about youth if you are a young person of course not because this would certainly you know um uh, limit the scope of research of a lot of people um but still um and again here uh, coming out of discussion with young researchers um, i had um, uh, when organizing uh, youth for us, UNESCO youth for us, is that um, they do think that uh, you know the, this is this mantra of your um, the debates are about us but without us, right? So um, and again they argue that they can um, uh, as they represent, especially in the MENA region. Uh, over half of the society, they are maybe better connected. To, uh, to the grassroots and uh, they should be engaged in research, especially on uh, when it comes to the research on youth, uh, you know, struggles and doubts, just to make this research more inclusive and maybe more, um, and to, to produce more sustainable and inclusive policy recommendations, right? So, so um, youth is very popular topic, but just also for a kind of a box ticking, uh, box ticking that, but it doesn't have so far as for me. But again, and there may be other voices. Um, not much analysis when it comes to the real uh, preoccupations of young people, but rather maybe on the impact of the you know discontent of youth on the macroeconomic issues, right? So, uh, so this is, this is about about youth. Um, Maybe you'll also add something about uh, gender in, in, in research, but maybe later on, again, Pauline and, and Laura, you can you can feel free if you want to uh, jump into the... Uh, yeah, can I just add a couple of comments? Um, so generally, um, I think think tanks need to look at their recruitment practices um, and examine them a lot more um, to kind of take into consideration the things that you've, you've just raised, particularly you, Marcos, that was really interesting. But I wanted to add... Um, do we, 
when we think of think tankers, um, so the people that work in think tanks and think tanks themselves, do we already have preconceived notions of what think tankers should be or are, what they look like, you know, what kind of skills that they should have? Um, and, you know, has anything been done to kind of examine that? Because that might already um, kind of limit who we think is the ideal think tanker and that might exclude people already on that basis. Um, and is and to add to that, is that then what we see is, as, or what we perceive to be an ideal think tanker, is that already gendered? So I think a lot more needs to be done to examine that. And I know Enrique that actually um, on think tanks had a series from 2015 looking at women on think tanks, and that was um, to look at those kinds of questions um, and that's what I'm really interested in looking at that as well as um, the external research that feeds into that. Um, but yeah, looking internally in think tanks at their structures um, and practices, I think is also really, really important. Um, and yeah, more research around that needs to be done, definitely. Yeah, this is this is the, the idea for a survey, right? Among the, 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 the think tanks around the world. Uh, what is the ideal think tanker according to you? <laughs> and we'll... <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Marcos, would you like to react or no? Okay. Um, no, not really. Actually, um, I was just remembering um, a book, uh, The Class Ceiling, which works, uh, which looks at sort of elite professions. I think it's based in the UK. Mm -hmm. And they talk about sort of the um, limits on which people with uh, without a sort of elite background reach in elite professions, which is around cultural fit. Which I think, also, uh, which could be connected to the point that you just made on what a think tank and ideal think, think tanker should look like. Um, actually, I, I thought a bit about it in in the context of my book, and um, the only answer that I that I arrived at in terms of what a think tanker should be, and please correct me if you think otherwise, uh, is that a think tanker is basically a is a position in a network uh, of someone who's basically that providing provide external advice that could be responsibly heated, that could be responsibly by whatever actor, especially governments, heated as experts. So, so the whole point of a think tank, a think tanker is to be able to be taken seriously. So what are the sort of barriers for uh, for a particular actor not to be taken seriously? Maybe there are some gender dimensions, obviously class embraced by your part as well. I don't really have an answer, just thinking aloud though. Yeah. We can we can tackle that also maybe with another I mean, our. I think you're on uh, mute. Audience. It's going to be hard for me to no, make that quick point. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. No, just <laughs> just to uh, bounce back quickly on uh, on this point, I think we're we're talking about reframing what the ideal think tanker is, but I think as a whole, and this has also been the, the guiding question through through our definition of diversity and inclusion at the binder and with all of the think tanks is, what is an expert, what is expertise and what does an expert look like? And maybe the need for us to kind of reframe and rewire, what do we think of when we think of expertise? Because at the end of the day, what we I think I mean, it's very it's a it's a gross stereotype of thinking. Okay, what is an expert? You think it's a senior person, and it's a person at with a top level pos pos position. The problem with that thinking, <laughs> the problem with that thinking is that if you if you're if you're in a senior position, then it's going to mean you're probably old. Uh, which it's already exclusive of, of younger generation. And if you're in a top level position, at least in Europe, that means that you're very, very likely to be a man and you're very, very, very likely to be white. So once again, so it's really about rethinking that expertise can come from different uh, from from different people. And honestly, the ones that we expect would be experts uh, uh, in this kind of conventional wisdom. So. I, I agree with that completely, yeah. um, obviously, and I think I'm, I'm often somebody who does not um, uh, fit the what does an expert look like, <laughs> you know, I, I'm young, I'm, I'm quiet, you can't see, I'm, I'm very short, <laughs> a small person, <laughs> like when I walk in a room, people think it's like, I often get called, who's that girl, like, you know what I mean, I, I don't, call, you know, I don't, I, I'm not that obvious person that people are thinking of, this is the important person the World Bank has sent to tell us things. Um, also, the World Bank has never sent me to tell people things, but <laughs> you get, get my point. But um, so I, I do think, yeah, we really need to broaden this this um, 
the conversation and brought in our imagination. And actually, there's a uh, Jessica in the chat was just uh, talking about how often there's a bias that economists, I think tech hasn't that's it, and everybody else, all the expertise mm -hmm. is kind of thrown out the window. And so there's even um, uh, like not all ex uh, forms of not all fields are created equal in this think tanker space and in this kind of expert space. And so I think that, that it's there's so many um, ways in which uh, the, the 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 playing field is not even um, in the space. And a lot of this is context specific. You know, in in some places, being perhaps being a, a young looking woman has is less of an issue than in, in other places for culture or whatever, you know, who knows? And so I think it, it would be a very difficult conversation for us to adjudicate right now the whole universe of ways in which the, 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 the playing field is not even. And so um, we flip it and think about what are the kind of the, the common principles that bind us, that cut across. And I'm not sure if this is a perfect uh, okay, it's probably not, it's not a perfect um, framework, but sometimes I think about science. Um, I'm, you know, a scientist, that's my background. Um, and, you know, this idea of what does a scientist look like? People have been doing this exercise for a long time to kind of um, shake up the stereotypes about what people imagine and what, what people think qualifies a science, not just who you are, but the kind of work you do. But there's still this sense of the scientific method and the ways in which you approach problems. <laughs> You know, and the, the 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 practice and process of science, uh, whether you are a tinkerer, a maker, uh, a kid in a backyard, or <laughs> you know, or a Nobel Prize winner, there's kind of the the method and the process and the the logic of science. And do we have a, a, a an equivalent of that in this think tank space, where this is how we I don't know approach the principles of how we approach complex societal issues and produce evidence and share it? I don't know. That, that moves us away from trying to create this really big basket of all of the different types of people that can be experts to this is what holds us in common. All right. Thank, thank you. Um, before we move to the to the part dedicated to more practical steps, let us now once again engage the audience, although I can see on the chat that the audience is already kind of engaged, uh, but let's engage them more. Um, and if I can answer, well, we can also answer to that on the chat. Uh, um, an open question to, to all of you. Uh, what is the biggest barrier to diversity and inclusivity in think tanks? Um, so let's see what are your thoughts in the chat. You can just type the, the replies on the chat, right? So again, I will type maybe the question. Um, um, Alexander. I can't okay. hear it. Thanks. Well, we're quick in typing. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, I agree mm -hmm. with that, Joy. Oh wait, is this poll in the in the poll section? I can see the question. Or? No, it's chat. Oh, it's a chat. Oh, right, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think to but if you think of recruitment for me that's too it's very uh, very good point to say that this is a a major issue. But linked, I think linked to that is a is proper training into what would, what is needed is proper training in uh, proper diversity training and proper unconscious bias because i think it's one thing to, yeah. to but then you're, you're going to have the endless debate of on positive discrimination and let's maybe not bring that here but uh beyond that i think it's important to maybe train uh train people who are uh who are responsible for recruitment especially at research level rather than hr um um who hopefully are trained on uh, on those aspects but it's it's training on unconscious bias uh, uh, for for this to work. And the second thing to yeah. recruitment, to going beyond recruitment, then then would be a, would be a talent retention, career and advancement as well. Because I think that's where you might be able to get on paper good numbers and a diverse think tank. But then if uh, but then it's uh, the devil's in the detail and into and looking at if you are able to retain people and if you are able to advance. Uh, people equally um, and inclusively is the is the challenge. Yeah, um, I have a point to add. Um, maybe um, to tackle inclusiveness in the world of think tanks, we all sh we also should look into what are the audiences of think tanks, uh, because perhaps it, 
if you want to appeal to certain audiences, you need a particular profile, which makes it more likely that you will hire a, set, a certain yeah. profile of person. Uh, or if you try to engage and uh, uh, with a different segment of the population, other types of profile will probably be uh, preferred. I was thinking of that in particular, actually linking this to uh, the debate yesterday on technology and think tanks. That is probably, we're looking at it from the production side, but maybe from the demand side would be interesting to look into as well. Yeah. So experts, yeah, in the, uh, like vis-a-vis -vis whom, basically. Yeah, exactly. So it's not only, I mean, of course, it's not only about the, um, this is the audience, right? So, so uh, this is an important point, I think, that the, in the end, the type of audience think tank have reflects maybe their recruitment, you know, practice or methodology. Um, but again, also, there is this big debate that maybe think tanks should, uh, you know, open up themselves just to survive uh, and not only limit themselves to, to, to the, you know, high, uh, well-educated um, PhD people, but also to other kind of audiences. So if they, uh, if they would like to then gain the public trust and legitimacy, then they would need to reflect in their organizational structure uh the, the the society at least in their countries right so so for instance here um the example i, I can give you an example of, of my uh think tank where i work we focus on euro mediterranean issue and uh one of our objectives is to empower women uh probably speaking empower women uh, right in the in the euro mediterranean region and when when you analyze the organizational structure of our institute, over sixty percent of employees are women, right? So so this already um, create a sort of a, a trust and gives us broader legitimacy for our actions. Uh, so women which are employed at the IMED are not only in the administrative. Um, and operational uh, positions, but are also directors of departments. Uh, so this is so this is an important mm -hmm. thing, right? Um, and also when it comes to geographical scope, uh, I'm an example here. Although I'm from Poland, so not very Mediterranean country, but still uh, there are not only Spanish uh, people, but also um, the policy of my institute is to employ. Uh, you know, diverse people from countries, especially in the in the Mina in the Mina region, and it's um, of course presents some difficulties when it comes to recruitment because there are a lot of paperwork, and maybe because of this paper paperwork, some institutes, at least in Europe, simply do not hire um, you know experts from the south because uh, there are a lot of visa visa struggles, visa issues, right? Um, uh, so this should be also considered maybe when it comes to, you know, employing people from other regions. Um, but uh, but uh, I think that this should be maybe um, also the way think tanks should work, right? So reflect, try to reflect the focus of their work in their organizational structures. I don't know whether you... Um, agree on that, whether you think that uh, the, the inclusiveness and diversity in think tanks um, that affect the legitimacy and maybe increase the public trust or, or, or it doesn't correlate at all. Anyone on that? Or maybe someone from the... Yeah, we can, well, we can maybe... Uh, move on to more practical steps uh, as we have a, a especially from the brussels binder um uh, pauline and then uh laura um that you also mentioned at the beginning uh, where you were presenting yourself that you are responsible for the gender um, and inclusion program at chatham house right and you are currently working um not sure if along with brussels binder correct me if i'm wrong on a gender and inclusion toolkit, right? Yeah. Uh, so if you can maybe um, reveal us, uh, the, the toolkit will be published soon. Uh, so if you can maybe reveal us a little bit of the content and what are the best practices and recommendations that you include when it comes to gender inclusiveness in think tanks and whether you think, because still Brussels Binder 
focuses on, and maybe the, this took it also on European think tanks, but matter whether you think that some, some of the best practices or recommendations may be applied to other regions. I'm sure. So if I could just very briefly kind of set the scene and tell you a little bit what we're doing um, about at Chatham House, and then I can segue that into the toolkit. Um, sure. <clears throat> so very briefly, um, we, we have an uh, inclusion and diversity program at Chatham House, um, and broadly it takes a very integrative approach um, that strives for a diverse workforce um, across the entire institute that is supported by um, inclusive structures and policies that, you know, kind of enables everyone to bring their authentic self to work and is enabled to work, uh, is enabled in their role and their position and feels comfortable to, to, to be to be that person um, and to work um, within their departments and stuff. Um, so by that, I mean, like we take a holistic approach. So we don't just focus on one little area and do one thing. We look at um, the de connected departments, research programs and activities as like a, a whole kind of ecosystem and see like where the interlinkages are and things. So like when you um, change one thing at a structural level, you know, it kind of has cascading effects. So we're trying to think of it like that. Um, and then within that, I coordinate um, the gender working group. So we have like many focal points, um, but I coordinate that group that specifically looks at gender, but taking a very intersectional approach, recognizing that women are not just one um, homogenous group and, you know, trying to take in the diversity of, um, <clears throat> of all the identities. Um, of all women's identities and stuff. Um, so this work has been ongoing for about three years. Um, we have a, um, a gender action plan to, that underpins our work and it has like three focal points that, I, that we take to be like the main kind of activities um, within a think tank. So research, events, so convening and debate um, and communications and publishing. Um, and within that, we have like specific action points. Um, I won't go through it all because um, we'll run out of time, but happy to speak separately with people uh, to kind of give you more detail on that. But um, there's like uh, specific objectives that we try and meet. Um, and then they all, all the objectives kind of feed into the larger Chatham House um, structures and policies. So they're kind of like all interconnected, um, if that makes sense. So over these three years, um, obviously you've been working with a lot of people, uh, such as the Brussels Binder and Pauline, um, trying to network a lot and see what other think tanks are doing. And one of the main things that I really struggled with is um, kind of looking at the research and evidence from the think tank space and like trying to share resources with my colleagues on how to do certain things. And there really wasn't a lot um, of specific think tank uh, based resources. So then we had an idea to produce um, a toolkit specifically for think tanks on how to tackle um, um, like gender analysis in research, how to do inclusive convening, um, and how to do gender sensitive communications and publications. Um, so I, this is a project, this, this specific toolkit I just want to uh, uh, highlight is not with the Brussels Binder um, mm -hmm. because I'm working separately with them on another toolkit. So there's going to be lots, all of a sudden, <laughs> we're going to give okay. them um, little resources to many uh, think tank, uh, to many toolkits. Um, I think the main, po the, the main different uh, point that kind of differentiates these sets of work is that based on the experiences of Chatham House and um, having convened a group of think tankers and uh, practitioners from various sectors throughout 2018 and 19, um, we kind of put together um, through a series of workshops uh, the components necessary for a toolkit and we generated the content from, from those sessions um <clears throat> to make up this one and it's basically um, a whole organization approach rather than focusing on say just events um and i think that's the main uh point to kind of that differentiates it so I, we, the toolkit really tries to um encourage a structural change rather than focusing on one specific area um and 
similar to what we're doing at Chesham House, there will be three focus points. Uh, again, uh, as I mentioned, uh, comms, publishing, events, and research, but connecting that to structural and policy changes that need to take place within a think tank that addresses sis uh, systemic barriers um, that you know can't be fixed if you're just looking at, say, adding women into uh, policy debates. Um, so it's really trying to get think tanks to really broaden their thinking out, um, looking at senior management and leadership and what is, what is necessary um, to, cut, to make um, a think tank inclusive. And then again, trying to get think tanks to interrogate what inclusion looks like and what, the, what does that mean. And, I'm, and I, I again want to make the point here that will be very context specific because I think context is really important. What applies for, say, Chatham House in London will not necessarily apply for think tanks elsewhere. Um, but um, as Rose, you mentioned, I think there are some common principles um, and uh, practices, best practices that I think definitely can be shared. So the the, the toolkit was devised um, in obviously in London with people based here. So um, I have to acknowledge its limitations as it being potentially very Eurocentric, um, but hopefully it will be a good starting point for wider discussions um, and kind of serves um, will serve as um, an entry point for um, further action. So not just raising awareness, because I think we're getting to the point where we all know what needs to be done. We just need to make it happen. And I think there is really um, like a lack of action. Um, I think that's particularly the case for think tanks in, in the UK um, and Europe and maybe even in the US. I, d I don't want to speak uh, wider than than outside of the, the context that I know. Um, but yeah, we're really trying to push for solid action because I think there's three things that um, for me that I found kind of hold true. And it'd be interesting to hear this uh, from, from everyone else. And there's three things that stand out for me. Um, and it's that there's a, a lack of data and I think we've already addressed this. There's a huge data gap within think tanks. Who works in a think tank? Um, is it gender balanced? Like, you know, I think we're, there's only been a few studies that kind of look at that. Um, there's one from uh, women in international security looking at think tanks. Bless you, Rose. Um, Bless you. Think tanks in, uh, if this is the virus, we are safe. <laughs> um, looking at think tanks in Washington. I hope not. <laughs> um, and also in Europe. So I think we need to expand much further than that. And I'd really, really like to see the data. So when we do talk about solutions, it's based on evidence and hard data rather than trying to kind of um, fix things a little bit and then um, it failing because, you know, we're not we're not quite certain what the think tank landscape looks like. And I think there's lots of entry points for that, uh, which I won't go into mm -hmm. detail. Um, and then secondly, um, as I think I've already mentioned, solutions are not always turned into actions. We do a lot of talking, but where is the action? Um, and how can we turn you know, some of the research into concrete um, steps that we can use and bridging like the gap, the disconnect between um, the research and policy and actual like practical steps. Um, and then finally, um, increasing collaboration among think tanks, um, but really like not just say in the UK um, and between Brussels, but globally, like what can we learn from each other? And I'm really hoping that the thing, the toolkit that I'm producing will help to drive that um, kind of discussion where we can share best practices. So what, um, even if, if it means saying, well, um, the toolkit recommends that we do this, but that actually doesn't work for us. I'm really hoping that we can kind of, kind of uh, have that conversation and that leads to either the production of more toolkits that are more nuanced for various contexts um, or we can um, in later iterations of the toolkit add, add that kind of thing in but definitely um, just yeah working together more collaboratively so we're not siloed and that we're really sharing that best practice um, and I will share I've started over these three years that um, <clears throat> sorry I've been working at Chatham House um, I've created a dashboard of links um, where I've collected like everything because it was a bit of an avalanche of information so I wanted to organize that so I can share that dashboard with you and um, please share um, 
any uh, any links or any resources that you think are really great and that are missing from there and I'm happy to add them in um so yeah uh, I think that answers the question um mm -hmm. yeah yeah, <laughs> further or um, offline, whatever. So thanks, Laura. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, uh, the point is, uh, especially about the, the data, is very important for me because, as I as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, when I tried to, you know, uh, and I searched for information, and I was preparing for this session, uh, I didn't find any data on on the inclusiveness and diversity. And the only think tank where there is very clear data published about the uh, workforce is Brookings, but I'm not sure it's maybe because of the, the fact that they're required to publish it, right? Um, but actually you can see how many women, um, how many, uh, you know, millennials, uh, Generation Z or X uh, working in Brookings and also uh, what kind of ethnicities are um, are in, in Brookings. So maybe this might be also the first thing to encourage think tanks to, first of all, publish those kind of statistics on their websites. Um, uh, Pauline will, will jump yeah. through, right? Um, there are, you, you already yeah. said, right, that there are some statistics on gender, but maybe those should be broadened up, right? Because um, European societies are not, um, are very diverse, uh, right? So we are not all the white people, maybe. Exactly. Um, um, can I just, so, so this might be the first step, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Pauline, all right. You... Can I can I just add one? Point? Sorry, ahead. sorry, I've yeah. spoken a lot. Um, when when we do collect the data, it really needs to be intersectional. Um, when we yeah. collect data, it needs to, it needs to drill much further down than just men and women. We need to do yeah. a lot more because when, when you do look at the data then, for example, um, you know, there's no information then um, on, for example, women of colour. So we really need to be clever and good with, our, with the data that we do collect. Mm -hmm. No, no, I absolutely agree, um, and this is also one of the one of the steps and one of the the ongoing uh, or let's say upcoming work of the of the Russell's Binder working with our uh, with with the think tanks. But on the point of publishing, I think there you can also on, it, we need to bear in mind that there it's sensitive information mm -hmm. first. So there's there's also concerns I think from a. Uh, more than even the bad yeah. press, but I think it's it's concerns of uh, the privacy of uh, of information that needs to be done. I think one thing that it would already be a major push, especially if we mm -hmm. since we do have a bit of a, a community growing of think tanks, is share at least already internally. Doesn't need to be completely in the public domain, or uh, but at least has a base for discussion. And as Laura, you completely rightly mentioned that it's 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 absolutely important in the same way that we we do collect data and evidence for for research we need to do exactly the same for that undertaking and it needs to be based on a, on an analysis of of how the data uh, is evolving um and on that note also that it that's what speaks volume i think to the management and the leadership structure in an organization um because if we one of the big struggles and i think someone mentioned that on the chats that one of the big barriers is also that uh you need to have a you need to have support at the leadership level in think mm -hmm. tanks to that truly awesome. do, do something and to really make those calls for action actually be implemented um and in that regard maybe that's me and my own bias as an economics think tank but i think figures and facts really are the best advocate for that if you can show what's happening so I guess for me, if there's one thing is really start tracking numbers, start tracking, start doing statistics. They don't have to be necessarily published, but at least for internal purposes, they're, they're of the major importance. Yeah. yeah. Rose, would you like to um, add anything to that? Any? Um, I missed a little bit of uh, the discussion. I think, Laura, when you're speaking, because um, my system shut down. So I, I, I hopefully I'm not repeating so anything or saying something completely out of context. Um, okay. Yeah, I think one thing, I one important lever I've found is um, to help solve the data question is actually at the funder level. Mm -hmm. Obviously different uh, think tanks are funded in different ways, but I think that this is one party that has a lot of power to require a lot of data and often they do, it just doesn't make it um, out into the public domain, but you know, funders often have a lot, all sorts of reporting requirements, and they have a lot of leverage 
Um, uh, they can also not just require for, and, and often not just, they often don't only require certain metrics, but they actually advocate for like, you know, tell us what you're doing on gender, tell, you know what I mean? So I don't know if there are any funders in the audience, but how can we kind of work collaboratively and productively with funders to help uh, increase the pace of the, the data generation? we're doing on diversity across all of these metrics but then also now yeah. it isn't, isn't too burdensome on us think tankers <laughs> um one thing also that's a practical step that, at least for youth um i know the quota it's uh no it's it's a it's a topic that maybe we don't want to cover because it's uh sometimes people are arguing that quota is a solution to at least introduce somehow or um, maybe increase this awareness um, when it comes to gender inclusiveness, but also but also youth. Um, we did introduce quota for young researchers at uh, at uh, in our network, and um, we had to do it unfortunately uh, because we tried to convince senior researchers to simply instead of coming to the conferences uh, all the time to send and empower the you know young employees of their think tanks but it didn't um we we didn't um, we didn't encounter a very a lot of positive responses to to that so so the only solution we were obliged to the solution we were obliged to to introduce was uh, was simply to create a platform for young researchers to to engage um, and they are not totally disconnected from the senior researchers because we conduct it on a on a yearly basis and it's back to back with our big conference but still um, we had to first uh, create a specific platform for young researchers um, just to be able to you know increase their visibility maybe um, and we and and we found it very rewarding, uh, and and a lot of positive feedback from young researchers we received on that. Um, but of course, again, as you said, it's also uh, the, the awareness is there, but there are some you know personal maybe blockade also when it comes to donors. It depends, of course, especially in the MENA countries. Um, I'm not sure how they are funded and whether it would be actually well seen by some governments to have more young people mm -hmm. um, because some governments also consider young people to be more maybe rebellious so it's not the the option uh, in some countries in Egypt or um, you know to, to have a lot of young people working in a in a think tank right so it, again it's all once again um, context specific but um, I'm sure that other also people joining the the, the conference will have more, um, I did not follow the chat so far, but I'm sure you will have more um, more inputs on what we can do uh, in addition to data and quota options. So so yeah, Kika, if you would like to, um, this is our, what we, what we uh, our contribution. So maybe we can just start the, um, the debate with the audience. Too much time, though, sure. by the way, Sorry. because we're coming to the end. Oh, but uh, we've had uh, we've been having a debate. I don't think uh, we should worry about that. Um, you had a you yeah, had okay. <laughs> you had a final. I was concentrated on the, on the panelists were saying. Dora, you had a final set a final mm -hmm. question you wanted to ask yeah, the audience true. about a big change that they felt could be um, could be significant. I'll, I'm going to share that with uh, everybody. That's um, true. So. Um, yeah. Was, what is the one change you think uh, would have the greatest effect on improving diversity and inclusivity in think tanks? Um, I guess that's if you had the power to uh, to promote it. Um, so any any contributions from participants will be will be welcome. Mm, and from I'm change. from the, the conveners. I, if I can, if I can join mm. in as the uh, convener of the whole thing, um, and I, I've been quiet, but I do think that one. I mean, uh, Laura, you alluded to this. The, the business model of many think tanks is designed with a number of assumptions. You know that that you can work for very little money. Um, you know, for a while, uh, it uses a lot of interns. Um, there's a lot of influence that takes place in private through personal networks and connections. 
and it, it, it assumes it's going to use those personal networks and connections to be influential. So that's not something that is budgeted for. And so in a way that requires um, that you hire from a small pool of uh, people who come from well connected backgrounds, um, who can afford a, a year in London interning at a think tank probably, uh, and not getting a proper job. Um, uh, it, in, in Peru, I think it's, it's, it's I, I found it very, very stark uh, hiring in think tanks of uh, researchers is done entirely through informal networks in, in private uh, and also at university uh, at the university level there are no at, there's no uh, no advertising for for positions almost it's 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 you call on people who came to university before that you know and so inevitably you end up hiring from the same very limited pool of people so I think it's a business model issue that then as you say has implications to different aspects of the of the organization and of course in the context right so in you know yeah. whatever happens in that particular society will have an influence but I, I think that rethinking your business model for many organizations will be crucial and I like Rose's uh, recommendation that funders should be doing more um, to demand at least demand the evidence you know, demand information so that we can uh, see that information see that fact that data of what's going on in, in the yes. in the organization anyway that's my my small contribution I, i'm i'm looking forward to your um to your toolkit and other toolkits and other other ways uh, especially if they if they think help us think about the whole organization and as you say not not just the you know the 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 all male panel shaming or the or the the you know the the list of authors you know make sure that it's more diverse so i think th those are things that are important but but we need to think about the organization as a whole. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So that's it, right? Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. could, I, could I just want the man, the uh, man, the man in the panel wants to be the last, uh, has the last one. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just a bit of. Um, yeah, shame, shame the self-promotion that the uh, working paper that I'm working for for uh, on Think Tanks is precisely on this issue. And hopefully it'll be out by the time uh, we meet in September. Uh, we're going to look at, uh, yeah, inequality of access, focusing specifically on class, but we're going to gather all the other data as well across eight countries, eight selected countries in Europe and Latin America, uh, divided by the Gini coefficient of how unequal the country is. Okay. Um, but yeah, we're very looking forward to have something to show you in that respect. All right, maybe I'll Great. I'll say something so that we don't end uh, with a man speaking, and then I think this becomes a man else <laughs> automatically. <laughs> <laughs> so I think Thanks, the point, and I, I like what you said, Alexandra, about like your efforts to have more young people kind of having exposure to the conferences and the your misadventures with the quota system and. You know, I think quotas are complicated and often as a blanch tool don't work, but I think there are ways to do to do the kind of thing you're describing that don't necessarily create these separate and not equal ghettos of where the young people have their own discussions. And, you know, I think um, uh, they still are room for young people or less ex experienced people to learn from the elders. And so it's not. Uh, it's just forcing the experienced people to bring at least one young person to the conference so that they can, you know, experience it you know what i mean and i remember when i was in grad yeah. school every year each of us the students we had to go to one conference at the very least at least do a poster even if we're not on the main stage and this was all part of our our learning and so it doesn't have to be something that is threatening where now i my 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 um visibility in the main stage is being taken away by a young person but then just thoughtful ways to include whether it's young people or women who are less experienced and are newer to the space um into these spaces through a mentorship approach almost. And, and hopefully the, the senior researchers in the organization, hopefully if they see it that way, it'll be, they'll be less threatened or you know, um, hostile towards the idea. Yeah, well, ho hopefully one day the, you know, the specific programs for youth, uh, young people will just disappear because they will be simply there, uh, right? Um, so, yeah. uh, thank exactly. you. by the way, I think that our panel was also as diverse as we could, uh, right? So this is thanks to, to Kike. Uh, uh, we had, you know, geographical coverage, gender coverage, what well, maybe not so much generational, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, thanks, thanks to everyone, and I will just read all the comments right now on the chat because I, 
I was just simply not following that. <laughs> Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you.